So, Paul, what do you think of Daylight Savings Time? It sucks. I agree. Uh, moving on. Last week, I wrote an article about possibly adding merchandise to the site. You know, some sort of 20-sided yeah. branded stuff. Yeah. The resounding answer I got out of that post was, nah. <laughs> like... And that makes sense. Like, uh, this is not a brandable thing. Uh, th there isn't, like, a famous icon of whatever on my site, you know? Yeah, it, it, you do so many different things. It's not like you've got yeah. this one central pillar, keystone property or right. whatever. You can't make an icon that embodies a 5,000-word rant on everything that's wrong with Kai Lang. Like, you can't turn that... <laughs> You can't turn that into... You can't put that on a mug. Um, so, ever, most people said nah. And that was a relief to me because... I, I have this thing where I worry all the time. Am I passing up opportunities? Could I be doing better? Could I be making more money for my family? And that one had been eating at me. And I think the answer there is no. There's not an opportunity that I'm just, like, ignoring. So I'm not going to worry about merch. There we go. I do think it would be fun if you offered like a shirt or two and, you know, got some, a little logo work done or something, you know, like on Teespring. I don't know what, what t-shirt sites there are, but it seems like there's got to right. be someone who's offering like to handle all the, because you're complaining in your post, like there's a huge amount of work if you want to do it all yourself and probably it's not worth your time. And it seems like there's got to be someone who's going to do the work for you and it just, you know, mark it up a bit more. Right. Oh, to be clear, I meant I'm not going to do merch through Patreon. That idea is absolutely dead. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody was excited. Nobody was like, oh boy, I would love to get merch through Patreon. I might still do, like, uh, just using Teespring or whatever, whatever new systems have arisen to supplant Zazzle. Yeah. Using those, no... No overhead. Oh, here's a freaky thing. I just thought of this. This week, I haven't... A, a decade ago, I had a Zazzle account where I sold t-shirts with DM of the Rings quotes. And the way Zazzle works is they don't send you money until you've got a hundred bucks in your account. And I was like, fine. You know, they'll just give me what's... But then t-shirt sales fell off and I never sold anymore. And they had 36 bucks of mine. And they've had that 36 <laughs> bucks for the last decade. And that really annoys me. Like, <laughs> there's no way to get it except to see. You can't just like cash out. You've just got to keep selling Man. more crap. And out of the. We started talking about that on Monday when I wrote this post. And then out of the blue, I haven't heard from Zazzle in years. Out of the blue, they sent me an email this week. You've got $36 left in your account. And I think their hope is that I would go in and spend it buying other people's t-shirts. But I just, you know... Oh, I see. Yeah, and I see it as sort of an admission. We've still got that 36 bucks we owe you and we're not giving it to you. Ah. <laughs> uh. I mean, it's only 36 bucks, but still, yeah. that's 36 bucks. It's mine. I had a Zazzle account, too, and uh, I don't think I ever sold anything. I, I put a few things. I did some 3D graphing and stuff and put a few posters up, and I don't think I ever sold anything. I think I made it so that I could print out a poster of something that I made. And then I was like, well, you may as well, you know, like, it's right there for sale. But, uh, yeah. I'm glad that I never got as far as finding out that I wouldn't have gotten the money anyway. Right. Well, unless you make over a hundred bucks. So if I could sell yeah. exactly um, like $64 worth of merch, then... So would, wait, it's you know, like every hundred dollars? It's not like over a hundred dollars and they'll give you the whole balance? I think it's... I don't remember how it works. I shouldn't be criticizing them when I don't remember. I remember there was some problem. Maybe it was always, you have to get, have over $100 before we'll send you the money, but 
the money doesn't come into the account right away. Maybe they wait for shipping to clear or make sure there's no returns. So there was always this trickle of stuff later. Yeah. You know what I mean? Weeks and weeks. So even if you like, clear, you know, they send you everything and your balance is clean and then a few more shirts pop up that were bought six weeks ago. You know what I mean? That have finally yeah. cleared and there's not going to be a return and now the mo money's available to you. I don't know. It was something like that. I have a Shapeways store where I sell 3D prints. And uh, the nice thing about 3D prints is that they're completely non-returnable. You can't order a custom 3D model thing and then be like, actually, that's not what I want. It's like, no, you told us this is what you wanted. <laughs> we sent it to you. You can't return you, it. You, so you send, you send like the blueprint. It isn't like you describe it and they mock it up or whatever. Right, exactly. You send them a, a geometry file. So uh, when I sell something you know, on my store, uh, they just add it to the balance. And I think they could pay me every month. So it's still, you have to wait. But uh, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice having a little, little second stream of income. So if the model doesn't work, it's the fault of the person who sent you a dumb model that makes no sense. Well, in this case, I make all the models and upload them to the store, and then people can buy prints of those things. I see. But yes, yeah, sometimes people do send me dumb models, and I have to fix them. <laughs> Isn't that the way of things? So, the first real gaming news we have this week is what I think is a really interesting difference of opinion slash misunderstanding. So, here's... Here's what's going on. GeForce Now, which I have not even, I hadn't heard of. Like, everybody talks about Google Stadia. But GeForce Now is doing a very similar thing, where you sign up for their service and play games on their machines, right? So they've got some super souped-up monster computer, and you're there on your laptop playing the latest games at high settings. But it's streaming, just like Google Stadia, right? Sure. So you've got network latency and and whatever input lag you've got times two and all that. Right. But the advantage is Stadia, you have to buy games for on the service. This, you put in your Steam login and you have access to your entire Steam account on, G on their service. <laughs> or... Or put another way, they have access to your entire Steam account. <laughs> right, right, right. That's probably the better way to put it. Now, that would freak me out, but that, I mean, that has to happen for this to work. This wouldn't make any sense otherwise. But then several developers pulled out. And you're like, wait a minute, how can you pull out? And these developers sent messages to GeForce saying, we did not authorize you to put our games on your platform. Remove them now. And GeForce did. And the one I'm going to use, the, I have an example video of somebody discussing it with indie, de indie developer, long, I forget what the name of the developer is, but they made The Long Dark, which is like a survival, you know, frozen wasteland kind of game, right? Sure, you sure. Have to, like you have Daisy to with Snow. Right. But you don't, it's no PvP. It's just like survive. Oh, okay. And this person sent a message to GeForce Now and said, I never said you could put my game on your platform. You, you've got to remove it. I believe I should have control over where my games appear. And that sounds really reasonable. Like, of course, if there was a new gaming store and somebody put my game on it without asking me, then of course I'd be upset. Regardless, even if they gave me a great cut of sales or whatever, I'd be annoyed. Hey, you, you got to talk to me first. Hmm. And that's Except how... it's not really right. there. Right? Like, they already sold it to somebody. Right. It's like, if I, it's like if I sold you a 3D model, and then, like, you went to somebody, and you're like, hey, isn't this cool? And I was like, hey, 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 that's my 3D model. I sold it to you. I didn't sell it to the other guy. And right. And that's the real thing that's going on here. The developer of The Long Dark is like, hey, you can't control my game and put it on your platform. 
and they think it's about developer rights. But no, these are only sold games. This is consumer rights. Should the, like, Paul, if I were to, like, oh, my computer sucks. Hey, Paul, if I give you 10 bucks, can I come into your little area there? I know you're on, like, some sort of porch or patio-type situation there with yeah. your computer. and it's cold out here. It's the middle of winter, Seamus. It's, like, 65 degrees. <laughs> but I'll give you 10 bucks, and you let me come in there, you know, in the afternoon and play my games. Because your computer is so much better than mine. And then all of a sudden the developer of the long dark calls you up and says, Hey, I didn't say you could you could have Run access Seamus's to my games. game. <laughs> right. I right. Didn't say, and it's like, you don't get to say anything about this developer. I bought the game for you. It's from you. This is the nightmare dystopia that we were worried the big publishers were going to be doing to us. Where they oh, control no. where you where and how you play your games and they can just no you know what i don't allow windows 11 to play my game you'll have to buy the windows 11 version like that's the nightmare scenario and this is basically an expression of that idea like no you're not allowed to play on that platform you only, only play on the basically platforms from where I indies allow. it's like it's so weird that right? the, that is coming from like these small developers who like they should be happy that people are playing their game I don't know. It seems, it makes your it seems game, really backward. It makes your game more valuable without you having to do anything. It's just, why would you be so petty about this? What do you want, a cut? Do you want a cut from GeForce now? For, because you made for a game? Running their, because they have a good computer? Like, what is it that you, what do you want? What do you want a cut of? That would be like them wanting a cut of the money I give you to play games on your computer. It makes no sense. And I'm so disappointed that it's indies. I mean, it, it doesn't feel good to dump on indies. If this was like Activision, it would be just sheer rage and pitchforks and protests. And uh, then again, I mean, you wouldn't even notice because that's been going on around Activision for months. It would be yeah. like the protest crowd would get 3% bigger. <laughs> um, but it's just disappointing that it's an indie. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. There's always going to be somebody. There's always going to be somebody who says something dumb or makes a dumb decision. It's like, well, okay. This doesn't seem representative. I don't know how well GeForce Now is doing, but uh, hopefully, it's not representative of the community. Right. Other places have also pulled their games, but I don't remember the names of the... This is when the story caught my attention with The Long Dark, but it was not the first game to do this. And some of the other ones were bigger, okay. but I just, you know, got onto this train at The Long Dark. Yeah, so I just noticed that uh, The Long Dark was written in Unity, and I wonder if the Unity game engine has some sort of fee per install as opposed to fee per like license or something i've never heard of so and i've read the unity stuff but i don't know it could change it could have changed since the last time i, I read it i'm just trying to figure out like if there's some justification because if it was a thing where it's like you know per user as opposed to per purchase or something like that then all of a right. sudden they've got like another 10,000 installs on this server farm and they don't see any more income and so they look into it and like oh well this, you know the server farm installed all these games yeah so here's a funny thing that's been happening on my blog i um there's a wordpress plugin you know i run wordpress that runs the blog yeah. there's a plugin my wife discovered recently and she got me to try it called Securi. And it's just this general purpose security plugin. And I thought, hey, more security is good. It turns out most of its features I don't need because I've already locked down my website. Like <laughs> this is more this is more, you know, kind of help help out less technical people secure their site. But I installed it thinking, you know, I could have missed something. I'm I'm not a sure. WordPress. Yeah. Yeah. See expert. what it's got to offer. Right. And a lot of the stuff like the, the huge security holes in WordPress are like, if you're logged in, 
as a someone who can publish articles, then you can also just arbitrarily edit the source code to any part of the site. <laughs> And if you're a contributor, you can upload files like you can. So if you know, you arbitrary to write an article, binary code. Yeah. Well, it's intended so you can upload images. But if you fiddle around with like, if you do some sort of shenanigans with pathing, you can get it to put uh, a file in some place outside of where files are supposed to go and those files oh, okay. instead of being images can be php and then you can do something else to execute them and then you you know you break the site so there's a bunch of vectors that were you know threat vectors that were added to make wordpress usable by non-technical people but i've locked all that down you, none of that i don't use it i you know access the site through ftp and i edit the site on a completely different computer so they're you know the site is locked down. But I installed this plugin anyway, and one of the things it does is it notifies you when you're being attacked. And I started getting these regular emails, hey, there's a brute force password guessing attack in progress. And I was like, oh, huh. that's weird. And apparently, I mean, I get one of these every single... I've had this installed for two weeks. Every single day, I think twice a day, I was getting one of these emails. And it was just the world's dumbest brute force attack. It just looked at all the users. So that's everybody who's ever written an article on my site. Or anybody who's ever basically had access to gold text in the comments. Think of it that way. Anybody sure. that can log sure. in. So me, anybody from the spoiler warning crew, you, Bob Case, Heather few other people it just apparently just tries to log in to each one of them once or twice and so you can imagine how sophisticated that attack is you know try to log yeah. in as <laughs> try to log in as heather oh what password should i try heather nope didn't work <laughs> like and even if it even if it did work nobody else has access to the site except me like to any of the sensitive parts of the site to me. Right, right. And Either they logged in, it would be like, what are they going to do? Write a, a random article and, and ask you to approve it for publication. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. And they're, you know, the admin, the admin password, even I don't know it. I copy paste it from my password manager because it's an unbelievable number of just scrambled characters long. <laughs> But, you know, they're probably just guessing common passwords that have been broken out in the wild, right? I mean, that's the usual thing. Sure. Sure. But after this happened, I was annoyed with getting these emails every day, even though these attacks were pathetic and, and statistically not a threat, you know, at all. The sun will literally burn out before, you know, trying two passwords, trying four passwords a day on each one of these accounts um yeah you're not getting in <laughs> before the sun no, goes dark the, yeah the, the entire html structure of data transfer will be obsolete by the time they no they still won't they still won't get in right but i i finally just decided to block the the ip addresses and i entered them into a locator and every single one of them was in romania so it's probably just one person <laughs> I'm, I, I, they have five IP. It's the same five IP addresses over and you know it just cycles through them, you know, real predictably. Five different IP addresses, all of them based in. Now that doesn't mean the person's in a Romania. They could be using a yeah, it's a, a yeah a tunnel uh, what do you or call something. That? Yeah, a tunnel in yeah. um in Romania, but it's probably just one person trying the most pathetic and primitive attack in the world and i feel kind of hurt it's I... probably it's probably someone's like 10th grade programming prank that they wrote and then forgot to turn off right and it's just sitting there knocking on the door of like a million like it probably has that that 12 hour cycle it's on it's probably how many blogs it's it's trying to hack, right? <laughs> like it comes right. around, it comes around every 12 hours. It finishes the list and loops through it. But I'm hurt because I think my site is more popular than that. I'm kind of hurt that I've only got like one really dedicated hacker. 
<laughs> They're really a really dedicated, psych- really stupid hacker. <laughs> right? So, I feel like I've been snubbed. Are you asking people to... No. No. No, this is not a challenge. I mean, if there was somebody who really, really wanted in and they were really smart, you, uh, you know, they could probably find their way in. This is why I also do nightly backups and have a mirror of the entire site on my machine. Just in case they get through. So you're saying that if someone can silently subvert your install, they can get that subverted copy onto your home computer? <laughs> uh, no, I... The mirror only goes one way. I only upload. Oh, I never okay. download. Yeah, never download. Good, good. I'm glad. So, one of the reasons the next video I'm making is taking so friggin' long... We, we were talking about this before the show. I didn't talk about this on the show. The next video should... The next This Dumb Industry video should come out tomorrow for people listening to this show now. It comes out on Tuesday. And it has been a bastard of a project. And part of the problem is that I needed footage from three different games that I didn't have footage for. Oh, no. I had You were talking about this, too, about, like, when do you stop trying to get footage and just go on YouTube and capture something? Right. And I could not find good footage of the stuff I wanted online that was Creative Commons. So, and I was like, we're going to need this stuff again. These games I talk about a lot. Like Tomb Raider 2013, most of the material I have on that is screenshots. Because that's how I did it back in 2013. I didn't have terabytes of storage to store an entire Let's Play on. You know, full game footage. So I had to play through that. Right. Then Isaac, I can't believe I needed a scene from um, Batman Arkham City. And I have a full record. I have a recording of Batman Arkham City. But just by blind luck, I stopped the recording just because, you know, I was trying to save space. And then picked it up five minutes later. And that point in the middle is the footage I needed. Oh, no. So, so Isaac played all the way through Arkham City, I played all the way through Tomb Raider 2013, and then I just played through most of Wolfenstein the New Colossus. And I've decided I hate this game. New Colossus sucks. Like, I was cold on it, you know, when it was new, and I was like, this isn't quite as good as the original. No. This is a terrible, unfun, stupid game, and I hate it forever. And I'm sorry I ever, like, said nice things about it. Wow. And this is... Yeah. Uh, you played it on your old computer, and now you're on your new computer, right? Right. I played it at 15 frames a second, and now I'm playing it at, you know, 4K, um, you know, 60 frames a second. And I kind of, back in the day, I gave it... A pass. I figured, well, yeah, it sucks at 15 frames a second, but I'll bet if the gameplay was smooth, I'd be having fun. And no, gameplay is silky smooth, and it's just terrible. The kinesthetics are terrible. Bad guys, you just shoot bad guys, and they feel like horrible bullet sponges, and when you finally kill them, they just sort of flop over like a marionette with their strings cut. They, you uh. don't, they don't like... <laughs> get blasted backward by the sheer force of this giant shotgun you're using. It feels it it feels like you're just making them take a nap. The game is just so so tanky and nerfed and nothing feels like it has any kick or punch. Oh, it's an awful feeling game. Awful. I can't believe this came out, I, I forget who made this, but you know, this is inheriting the legacy of, of first-person shooters, going back to Wolfenstein. I can't believe how bad the gameplay is. And the story hasn't gotten any better? It has a different ending? <laughs> the story has not gotten any better. My third time through, man. These horribly long cutscenes. Like, these cutscenes are so long, I just, every time there was a cutscene, I just, you know, made sure I was recording, turned down the volume, and brought up my phone, and would, like, scroll Reddit for 10 minutes until it was over. <laughs> they are so bad. So tedious. Wow. So obnoxious. Worse than Reddit. It's, that's harsh. 
Oh, I'm, you know, like, looking at the Reddits that just provide you a steady trickle of, oh, that's a cool picture. Like, I'm a fan of, like, Earth porn, where it's just like, oh, wow, there's a valley I've never seen. But, oh, there's another picture of the Grand Canyon. You know, stuff like that. Really easy to digest. Oh, sure. You know, pretty images for 10 minutes. Or memes, or jokes. I, I, I like programmer humor. <laughs> programmer humor is is a really good subreddit. Anyway, New Colossus sucks. I'm sorry I ever said, oh, I don't think it's as good as the previous one. No, it's a terrible game. Objectively, worst game ever. <laughs> worst game? Literally unplayable, he said, after he finished his playthrough. <laughs> What what's actually literally unplayable is E3 this year. <laughs> yeah, you going to E3? No, uh, uh, I've never been to an E3. You know, it was it was an option like for a little window in there, and I live close enough to. I think it's in. What is it? Where is it? In L.A. Uh, it's definitely one of the big cities in California, but I don't remember which one. I remember back when I was a kid. Being like, oh, we could go to E3 this year, and like they've opened it up to the public. Maybe we should try to get in. And uh, I never made it, but there was a time when that was like the holy grail of of gaming culture. You know, the mecca that you would go to if you were a real gamer. Ten years ago, I was posting rants at the Escapist, saying, "Why do these companies spend millions of dollars going?" You know, you're spending millions of dollars to go to this show, to build these elaborate displays, to promote your product. Why don't you just put it on YouTube? And the answer everybody said was, well, you can, you can connect with all the journalists at once. And it's like, yeah, but you're competing with all the other games that are trying to talk to the journalists at the same time. <laughs> like, it just right, seems you'd like... You really want to jump into that mosh pit? When when you could have your tailored audience right there at your fingertips on the internet? Right. Instead of doing it, like, why don't you just, like, three weeks before E3, drop your trailer? Nobody has anything to talk about then. Gaming sites are wide open. You know, nobody has any, everybody's, like, fig, trying to figure out what to write about. And you can jump in. And fill that vacuum, and all anybody will talk about is your thing. But no, you're going to do it when 500 other games are trying to grab the spotlight at the same time. <laughs> right. Everyone screaming into the same microphone. And you're going to pay a premium to do that. And I didn't think it made any sense. And everybody said it was crazy. And I think the big publishers are coming around to my way of thinking. Sony is bailed. Um... A few companies have bailed. The creative directors of E3 um, dropped out. Jeff Keighley, oh, Jeff Keighley, that's the most important one. Jeff Keighley is like, no, I'm not going. And now there's coronavirus worries. And everybody's like, hey, this seems like a really terrible idea to have thousands of people from around the world confine themselves to these spaces. Like, that just seems irresponsible. You know, not just to each other, but to the, you know, wider community. The um, global community, yeah. Right, right. So, you know, people living around L.A. or wherever, just... Oh, so, I think... E, I don't know that E3 is dead, but if E3 isn't dead this... If E3 is held this year, it will be dead in the sense that it will have extremely low in t attendance. Hmm. And then people get to see if it makes any impact on their bottom line. Yeah, and that could, if that, if it really doesn't, although this might be sort of a confuse, confusing thing. One developer goes to E3, they soak up all the attention, and they'll be like, hey, E3 got us a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great investment. So we're going to keep doing uh... it. You know, I don't know. It's it feels like the end of an era if this really is E3 dying because this has been happening over the last few years Everybody's making smaller and smaller commitments to it. Yeah 
Everybody's Didn't been risking Nintendo less. Nintendo stopped coming a while ago? Or has Nintendo yeah, ever gone to E3? I think they used to, but they're Nintendo Play, or I forget what it is. It's like a live stream. I forget how it works, because Nintendo really isn't in my wheelhouse. I just don't cover Nintendo games, and so... Yeah, they don't sure, really want but... anyone to cover their games, I think. <laughs> well, I'm still mad at them for how they behaved on YouTube for all those years. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. They they back they backpedaled on those policies, but I'm still sore about it. Oh, did they? I didn't hear about that. The yeah, bad press did. lives forever. Right? I remember I remember a betrayal far longer than I'll remember something great because I'm a horrible and negative person. Well, I mean, I just stopped listening to him after that. It was like, oh, okay. Right. If that's what you have to say, I can go elsewhere for my entertainment. Thank you very much. Right. And uh, if they want like to apologize, they're going to have to go way out of their way to get my attention because I'm not paying attention to them anymore. Now, PAX is still going on, right? Like, there's yeah. still PAX conventions. PAX East, I think, just happened, PAX, what, just last week, happened, two weeks yeah. ago? Sometime in the last two weeks, it, it was going on, but I was too busy. I just had too much on the plate, and I couldn't just sit there and watch live streams. Although I really appreciate that they're live streaming the show, and that's wonderful. Thank you for whoever decided to yeah. do that. Man, if if PAX like replaced E3, that would just be amazing, amazing irony. Now you've been to an I, E3 before, or not an E3, a, a PAX before, right? Did you go to PAX East some years ago? Yeah, yeah, I went to a couple of them. They are so fun. Oh, that's at, at my heyday with The Escapist. So I got to be on a couple of panels and, and you know, enjoy the life of, like, a Z-list internet celebrity. <laughs> right, right. The, the original a Andy Warhol quote is, you know, in Hollywood, everybody's fin famous for 15 minutes. And the the... This century's version of that is on the internet. Everybody's famous to 15 people. And that was my experience <laughs> at, at PAX. I got to be famous to 15 people. And that was pretty fun. And I got to meet I got to meet uh, Chris Cesarano. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Chris. Um, we met at PAX. And I forget what we talked about, but we had an interesting discussion. And then we've... We've traded a few emails over the years, and he still comments on the site. So that's that's cool. I got to meet uh, several people like that. Oh, I th though Chris is, I think, the only one still here ten years later. But yeah, I, it was really, really cool. That was like my favorite part is just getting to meet the people behind the names. That just made me so happy. But. It's also really expensive and time-consuming, and now Heather has a job, and so we can't go, because I don't travel without Heather. Well, and it's also a nightmare for introverts, because, like, I want to be here, I paid good money to yeah. be here, I don't want to waste it, but also I cannot bear to be on the show floor for another three seconds. <laughs> right? Oh, the show floor. So, you know, I pushed too hard to be on the show floor, I think. I think it's okay to let the show floor go and give it a miss. It's okay. Just go to the panels you like, because that's the fun part. The panels and the shaking hands with people and, you know, signing autographs or things that they bring with them or whatever it is that they, you know, that you do to interact with individuals. Give the show floor one pass and then call it a day. Ignore it. It's, it's, it's the worst part. It hurts your feet because you're walking on concrete it hurts your ears because it is super loud the crowds oh, yeah. Bring are dense plugs oh so loud uh and uh yeah it's just tough tough to be there and i never felt like i got a lot out of it it was such a blur like it would have been better i would have got okay like spec ops the line was being shown off there but it's so loud you stand in line for so long and then you just see a trailer, and then you leave, and it's just a sensory deluge of lights and sound for the next half hour. If I just sat there, watched the the video on YouTube, and then wrote a post about it, that would have been a better post. 
right? Because I could have watched it multiple times, looked up the history of the series, and given it thought, and it wouldn't have just been lost in the deluge of sensory input. Like, it's just such a terrible way of learning about games. Well, like I prefaced, for introverts, right? Like, we, we're both kind of on the same page there, you more so than yeah. I. But uh, there are people who just love that, who want to be there, who want to be surrounded by people all screaming and, and going every which way and a thousand things happening at once. Yeah, it's so alien to me. So alien. <laughs> Speaking of interacting with people, what do you say we answer some of these mail... Bleh, mail bags. Or meal bags. I could go for a meal bag. I'm hungry. Hmm. Um, all right, let's do one. With linear... Oh, there's no Dear Diecast in this one. I'm freaking out. How do I start it? I guess I just begin reading it. With linear games, you beat the campaign, maybe get all the collectibles, and you know you're finished. There's no clear stopping point in games designed for endless replayability. I keep finding a game I love, playing it until I get bored, and walking away vaguely dissatisfied, because even though I had a hundred hours of enjoyment, the most memorable part is that I quit on hour 101 when I wasn't having fun anymore. How do you decide when to stop playing a game you could play forever, and how do you evaluate it when the game doesn't change over time, but your experience of it does? 93. Thank you, 93. Paul, do you have this problem? I do, because I, like you, love procedural generation, and most games that have procedural generation don't have a real solid endpoint. They're just they're just avenues into which you can stroll endlessly, enjoying the patterns that they generate for you. Yeah, Factorio, Minecraft. There's a lot of them that are just you play them forever. Mm. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Dwarf have... Fortress. Oh yeah, that's a big one. I did. I haven't played. I haven't played Dwarf Fortress, but I know the stories of it are the the stories of how much of your life dwarf fortress can eat are legend <laughs> i i don't see games from this viewpoint i play a hundred hours of having fun and then when i get to 101 i sort of wander away but that's kind of when i'm i stop remembering when i think back on the game later i think of the 101 or the 100 hours that i had fun and not so much the 101st hour when i got bored which i realize um plays against my persona as as just this horrible negative critic who always nitpicks everything but that really is just how i experience games i think about the fun in fact i often go look back on games with rose colored glasses and i'll pick up a game like Oh, I remember enjoying this and then I begin playing and I suddenly I'm suddenly reminded of why I quit playing like oh <laughs> right this bullshit I totally forgot about this bullshit oh man oh don't want to keep playing <laughs> how many times has that happened with no man's sky that is my no man's sky experience and for whatever reason no Man's Sky has this mesmerizing thing it does to you where you think back on it and all you think of is pretty horizons and cool looking spaceships and neat little moments and then you immediately fire it up and you're like, wait, my pockets are full. Oh no, <laughs> why am I here again? Yeah, before you I can doing? even get into the game, you have to like click the button to load and then hold down the button to actually load and then you're like, wait, no, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I can't go back. Right. I, I, No Man's Sky was so good at that. Like, I came back to that game four times before I finally learned my lesson. And uh, to be fair, I came back when they were like, there's a new update out and everything's better. And I'd come back and be like, wait a minute, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I've been pranked. <laughs> everything's better except for the interface and the gameplay and the pacing and uh, story. Right, it's like, we added a bunch of stuff to the game, so now you can have even more crap in your pockets. And I'm like, oh, no, that's the worst thing. <laughs> oh, no. Here's a question for you, Paul. Well, it applies more to you than to uh, me. Okay, hang on, before we move on. So this, oh, okay. this thing about endless games, like, I, I have this problem, too, where it, I guess it's kind of the opposite problem of, like, I have the problem where I... I need to force myself to stop when I stop having fun. 
as opposed to I stop having fun and then wish I could have more fun. Because I'll be playing the game and I'm like, I have been enjoying this. The non-enjoyment I'm having right now must be an exception. I I have to just push oh. through it so I can get back to the having fun part. And like, I have to stop myself and be like, no, look, hang on. Like, you could keep on having this experience for a very long time because that's how the game is designed. But if right. it's not a good experience, then why are you making yourself do this? You're supposed to be having fun doing this or, or something. You're supposed to be learning or what, like, why is it you're doing this to yourself? So for me, it's hard to walk away. Uh, it's Or it's harder to walk away as opposed to harder to, uh, you know, just get bored. The gaming equivalent of continuing to eat when you're full. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, man, this is so good. I've been enjoying this meal. I... I know that I like this meal, because look how much of it I ate! <laughs> Surely there will be no consequences if I continue to play. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have that problem with real food. <laughs> <laughs> food is good, man. It's not fair. So, I, I don't know what to say to you, 93. Um, it It is a hard place to draw a line, but the game's not going to draw it for you, so I guess you need to come up with your own criteria. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. All right. Dear Diecast, my wife and I brought home our first baby last month, and I'm curious to hear your experience with balancing a growing family and also relaxing to a video game. How did you balance gaming with watching a newborn work out when one parent, you know, would watch the kids and the other could rest, and are there any good up late with the baby gaming activities you used. Um, Saber Dance. Thank you for a very good question, Saber Dance. I feel like you need to go first, Paul, since you literally have a new baby. Like, what the new kid is, what, a month now? Yeah, six weeks. So we also, we, our, our kids yes, are about Seamus. the same age, Saber Dance. Yes, Seamus, a month, six weeks, because that's how months work. You're so good at math, Seamus. <laughs> Uh, we don't play video games and watch the kids at the same time, um, because they both really require your full attention, or at least the kind of games that my wife and I like to play really require your full attention. So if you're, if you're responsible for the baby or the kids, you know, the kids are up and they're running around and stuff, uh, we just, we don't... We don't split that attention, right? It's like, it's not respon... In, in our view, it's not responsible. So, um, yeah, it is hard to, to game when you've got little... Especially infants. Uh, they do soak up, soak up a lot of time, and you just kind of kind of let gaming go for a while. Um, I guess the best advice I could give is don't be afraid to, to focus on your family, and, you know, when they grow up, Maybe they'll share your love of games and you can play games together. And that's some of the most fun I've had is playing Minecraft with my kids or, uh, you know, everybody watching over someone's shoulder while they're playing Oxygen Not Included or whatever and and uh, sharing that together. But you gotta, you gotta make sure that you invest in, you know, what's important, especially when they're tiny. My oldest is now 22 years old. My youngest is 18. So my days of balancing babies with gaming are long gone. But for me, I think it was just not a lot of gaming time. Just there was like a dry spell there where I pr probably only played a couple of games in the stretch between like 1999 and like 2003 when Isaac was, you know... Um, or maybe 2004. Like, I played some games, but they were few and far between. Uh, one, because we didn't have a lot of money. Because baby, the, spoiler, babies are expensive. And uh, we didn't have a lot of extra money, and we had so little time. So little time, and you're getting so little. So, and when they're really, really young, you don't get a lot of sleep. Heather breastfed, so, you know, there was, I didn't get up with the baby in the middle of the night, but she did but even then you know the kid cries wakes up sometimes she needs help and you've got to get up to just help her feed the baby or whatever it is she needs and you just those cu first couple of months you just don't get sleep yeah it's uh i don't know saber dance what your plans are for your family but two is the hardest once you get past two 
your yeah. own downhill slope. Because two, with two, especially yeah. if you have them close together, you know, the infant is just completely helpless. And so usually the wife is taking care of the infant. And then the the other baby is still like a toddler, you know, a little kid, maybe can talk, maybe can't. And so like our our second youngest, she needs help in the middle of the night, change diapers and, you know, she, she cries or she gets scared or whatever. And like, so you're both up all night you know off and on and and then, and then it's like morning time and it's like okay now we gotta be adults and like take care of chores and go to work and it's like oh no how long does this go on years what no i can't do this but somehow you do yeah the especially the newborn with the two-year-old we did this a couple of times because we had our kids boom 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 two years apart our kids were were all two years apart so that was very challenging it was um what was it 97 99 and 01 were our kids and so and that two-year-old is mobile so they can get you know they they, they can yeah, get absolutely. themselves into trouble they can get themselves into trouble and just make enormous messes and of course it's not their fault they just they don't know the rules of the world yet and so you have to show a lot of patience with them while trying to teach them to not do whatever that <laughs> dangerous slash messy thing was again, while you've also got another kid that's perfectly helpless and absolutely dependent on you all the time. And that is just maximum challenge time. The only thing that could be harder than that is twins. Oh, yeah. Thank God we haven't had twins. Yeah. Same. So, yeah, we had a... a a dry spell of very little gaming and when my kids got old enough that they didn't require that you know so much middle of the night care kind of when Isaac got to got above three that's when everything started get e getting easier and I started playing a lot more games the uh, the best advice I can give you saber dance if you want to stay in gaming uh, maybe you won't be able to game yourself but Watch let's plays and, and speed runs and things. Yeah, uh, it's it's a low cost, you know, easy on you know you can get up and walk away from it anytime, and you get to kind of have the feel of where games are and what people are interested in, and uh, still kind of keep in touch. Here's how starved I was for gaming uh, during that like six year stretch, end of the '90s, beginning of the aughts, where things were really tough. One of the few games I played in that time was Deus Ex Invisible War. And I didn't even realize it was absolutely terrible. Because <laughs> it was like <laughs> the first game I'd played in months. Oh, man. All right. Here we go. Dear 20-Sided, I enjoyed the What Have You Been Playing thread that went up a few weeks ago. If you don't get around to setting up forums slash Discord, whatever, can we have a lot more of those threads as a semi-regular feature of the blog? 93. I'm not even sure this was supposed to be a diecast question. It might have just been a question. No, it says Dear 20-Sided. I don't know. It came to the diecast email, so it gets answered on the podcast. Uh, yeah, I really liked how that thread went. That was... That was my favorite thread in weeks, is just everybody saying what they'd been playing. And I like getting that picture of, like, what everybody's really up to. Because, again, if you just follow, like, gaming culture, then you'll just assume, well... Okay, Doom Eternal just came out, so everybody's playing Doom Eternal, and now... You know, I don't know what other games are coming out. Watch Dogs just came out. Everybody's playing Watch Dogs or whatever. The most recent AAA game comes out. Like, you know that's not true, but that's the impression that public discussions leave you with, right? Right. And all the streamers are streaming the new games, and so it's like right. you look at any of the samples of media, and they're all just focusing on whatever's hot that week. Right. And so I think it's really healthy to read that. And to see what everybody's really up to. Now, I realize that mm, people that come to the blog aren't really representative of gaming as a whole. But it's still really relevant to what's going on in my, you know, it's still interesting to see how few of these people are playing the latest shiny AAA thing. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah, a, it's, that's it's the minority cool. thing. The most, 
the, the games that are played by a majority of people at any given time are being played by a minority of the people. Or the, the biggest games are being played by a minority of the people, just because there are so many games. So that was interesting. So to answer the question 93, yeah, uh, we're going to do that. I don't know that it'll be weekly. I think weekly would be overkill. But maybe a couple times a month, at least once a month, somewhere in that ballpark, we should do one of those. I think it's great. I also like write that gives me a chance to write about games that I wouldn't talk about very much normally. If you see what I mean, like, oh, I only played this sure, game for a like, day and a half. I'm yeah, like a little indie thing you picked up or something you saw a video about and you want to try or something, but it's not really enough for an article. Right, right. I I picked this up, played it for a couple hours, dropped it, and it's not that I hate it. I just you know. I found something else that I liked better, and it, that's a good time. That's a good thing to like round up all those games and give them a little bit of time. G otherwise, I'm only going to cover AAA stuff that I play all the way through three times because that's where my, my retrospectives come from. Dear Diecast, I was watching a talk by Catherine West, aka Chiron from Chucklefish. Um, where she was talking about how various programming paradigms work and break when developing video games. I'll put the link in the postscript. When Seamus was writing his series on Jai, he also discussed this topic, so I thought it would be of interest to you. In question form, do you think object-oriented ob programming is a bad fit for video game development? Vale, Tim. And there is a link to her talk um, in the show notes below, if you're reading this on the website. I am actually familiar with this talk. Um, for people who don't know this developer, you've probably heard of the game she worked on, Starbound. So that's that's the big game by Chucklefish. A good game, by the way. Yeah, I, I really like Starbound, too. It was like Terraria, but way more interesting. It's been updated a lot. I last played it a few years ago. I should go back to it and see yeah. what it's like. Yeah, they now. keep putting out updates. They've got mechs now. They've got what? Mechs, like like <gasps> robo suits. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That I think that's the last time I played. Is I jumped in a mech and ran around. And I was like, this is fun. But I heard there were a bunch of updates since then. Ah, uh, yeah. I I don't know if there have been. And that well, oh, we're getting off topic. <laughs> yeah, we are. So do I? Okay. There are a few things. Her talk is focused on the language Rust. And I'm unqualified to really answer this in detail. The reason I'm aware of this talk is to is because I watched Jonathan Blow's rebuttal. And, you know, that's the, the guy who made the witness. He did an interesting rebuttal, and his points are fairly technical and it would be a bad idea for me to try to repeat them from memory here on the podcast when they're not really my <laughs> positions you know like i'm not now, an was expert this enough specifically a rebuttal of catherine west's keynote yes or yes okay okay interesting yeah he was arguing something along the line and she was rust has something called a borrow manager where you and again i'm not I apologize ahead of time for Rust fans. I'm probably mangling this. But where you control which parts of the code have permissions to which things. And it often, in a game world where you have a lot of interconnectivity, like bullets can blow up barrels and barrels can blow up physics objects and physics objects can make the ceiling collapse and the ceiling collapsing can kill NPCs and the killing NPCs can cause explosions and the explosions can move other physics objects and everything affects everything else and all that stuff is making particles and sound effects and damage and and changing the you know every part of the game changes every other part. The the and crazy interconnectedness of a game really, really makes this difficult no matter what language you're using. And Rust has something called a borrow manager. I don't know how it works. And she says, her argument begins with, hey, the borrow manager led me to make good decision, good programming decisions, or, you know, made me write my code correctly. 
I always hate answers like that. Oh yeah, it seems like this feature sucks, but it's just trying to get you to do the right thing. And built into that is the assumption that everybody else is trying to do the same thing you are. Oh, this forced me to have a good design pattern by forbidding me from doing all these other bad things, therefore it's a good feature. And it's like, well, the option was always open to you to do the right thing. And maybe some of those other things that are prohibited, even though you can't imagine how that's useful, it's because that's not the problem you were trying to solve. I ran into this a lot as a procedural, you know, making procedural content, procedural walls and levels and characters and all that stuff. Always it was like, well, you're not supposed to do that. And I'm like, well, that that's what I need to do. It's like... Yeah, it's a little weird to have the program not import assets and to create its own. But that's that's the problem I'm trying to solve. And if your solution is load in some assets made by an artist, then you're not solve then you're not working on the problem I am. So your solutions won't work for me. Right. And yeah, that so that is I don't want to call it Stockholm Syndrome, but it is very much somebody that's focused on their problems and assuming their solutions will work for other people trying to solve other problems or different versions of the problems. Anytime somebody talks about the programming language forcing you to do things as being a good thing, I'm incredibly skeptical. Not that it's always bad, but that I'm very skeptical when I hear it. Yeah, and there's there's another aspect where where it's dangerous uh, because say that it really it really did force you to do that thing and and you really do think that that would be a good thing for everyone to do and maybe it would be a good thing for everyone but there's no telling if that's the best thing for everyone to do I mean just because something worked for you doesn't mean that it was actually the best way to do it or, or that you wouldn't have found a better way if you had been free to try all your options. Right. So I'm not qualified to actually rebut her. John Blow took a crack at it. You can decide. I'll put a link to his video in the show notes. You can decide for yourself if she succeeded or if he succeeded or if, if his rebuttal holds any weight for you. I'll leave that to John Blow and everybody else can hammer that out. I'm not qualified, but I was extremely like, I put up my one eyebrow like, hmm... Oh, it makes you do the correct thing. I heard that all the time. Looping this back to the second question, do you think object-oriented programming is a bad fit for video game development? I heard that all the time in defense of OOP. No, it just makes you make your pro program properly. And then I would look at, at the structure that people had written, and it was these insane class hierarchies that served no purpose, <laughs> made the code so complicated <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and created all these layers of obfuscation so that to find out the you know how a simple thing happens you've got to jump between six files and when you point this out they'd be like well yeah that person was doing it wrong and it's like well i thought the whole point of this was to force you to do the right thing <laughs> when so many people seem to do it so wrong is this really a good thing I would say object-oriented programming, you can't say is it a good fit or bad fit for game development. Uh, it depends on what part of the game engine. Like if you're out front dealing with entities and, and uh, you know, guns and bullets and barrels blowing up, all the gamey stuff, then yeah, it seems like a pretty good programming paradigm. Um, but if you're on the back end talking to OpenGL or Vulkan or DirectX, then absolutely no. Stop messing around with that. Go go back to your C roots. Go back to the rawest, lowest level because that's what you're talking to. You are talking to a raw, low-level system. You cannot abstract that into being simple. It's complicated and you're going to have to grapple. I mean... If, you, if you're really worried about performance. If you don't care about performance, then why are you even talking about it? Go use Unity. But if you're like, really need to push the hardware, then you kind of need to get down there close to the metal. That's where that work is done. And hiding it behind class hierarchies will not save you from the terrifying complexity that awaits you. And I think you touched on earlier another aspect of games that makes object-oriented maybe not a bad fit, but just not 
often appropriate uh, is that they're designed to balkanize the data and the the methods into a bunch of airtight containers and that's just not how games work like it's great if you're trying to make a, an accounting system or you know a, a warehouse management software or something but when you're trying to make a thing that is just connections between things like tools to help you sever connections aren't going to be often called for right there's a there's a sort of quasi or an evolution of the object oriented approach which i have never used i shouldn't say i've never used it i okay this is complicated to explain object oriented every object is every type of thing in the game is a different object right and then there's this new paradigm that's, I mean, new. It's like, I don't know, six years old or something. That's when I first heard of it. It was like six years ago. Where, yes, all the things in the game are objects, but they're all this sort of basic entity type. And then you attach components to the entity. So this entity is nothing within the game. It's just this abstract, here is a game thing. Well, what kind of thing is it? Well, it's just, it isn't anything yet. But then you will attach a component to it that's like a space marine component. It does all the space marine things. And the space marine will include other components. So, and this seems to be a much better way, instead of making a space marine object and a bullet object, and they're so wild and different, and they can't go in the same list, and they can't be processed at the same time because they're so different, you have this component system. And this is how Unity works, but I've never, like, worked on the... the <laughs> But I can't say I've ever used it myself, because within Unity, you just drag and drop. And that's not programming. <laughs> Like, you take an ent a game entity and you drag the physics object prop component into it, and now it will behave with physics. And then you drag and drop a, a collision box onto it, and now that's what its shape is. And I, I, I can't <laughs> see, seriously You feel claim. like you've never programmed with an ECS because you right. don't think that, like, drag and drop is programming, even though right. that's basically what you're doing. Right. I mean, within the code in Unity, you'll have to, like, ask the system, okay, I'm processing some entity. Um, does it have a collision box component? Oh, okay. It does then do all this stuff. So you sure. mildly... Or, or, like, you process all entities with this kind of component at this time or something. Yeah, stuff like that. But I've never, like, had to manage the components and, like... Like, this can get to be pretty hairy. Conceptually, it's like, okay, when do we get rid of the component? Um, when the object goes dead, or when it gets retired, and when does that memory get cleaned up? Like, it can get really, really complicated. Like, something else might have a pointer or a handle to that. Do we delete it now? Do we delete it in a second? Do we delete it on the next frame update? I've never had to worry about any of that, because, of course, in Unity, it's all drag and drop. And it's, you know, it's it's still got training wheels and, and padding on it to keep you safe, mostly. So basically, I'm not qualified to rebut her argument, but other people have. But I'm skeptical of, of her thesis. And I will agree that object-oriented programming is bad if you apply it everywhere. Do not be, do not be a zealot with object-oriented programming. Well, and, and that's kind of a general truth, right? Like, right. dogmatism is probably not appropriate anywhere. Right. And so much OOP. And people start... People have gone the other way. They're like, no, never use OOP. It's horrible. And it's like, well, you, no, writing things as if it was, you know, 1993 isn't the solution either. <laughs> like, there's power here. You just have to know when to use it. Yeah, I, I appreciate some some uh, object oriented, especially inheritance can be really, really nice for for structuring large scale data. You don't want to do it to everything, but when it's right. appropriate, it can be it can be a really powerful tool. Yeah. So that's all I can say on that. That's not very substantive. It's not very substantial. Um, but that's what I thought of her talk. It was a good talk anyway, 
and John Blow's talk is also interesting. So they're both one. I suppose uh, John Blow talks about the first five minutes and then he goes off and does his own thing. Uh, so if you really want to get <laughs> he does the tend most to do that. Right. If you want to get the most out of them, watch them f both. I would watch hers first, is how I would suggest doing that. I watched them in the other order, and I was kind of frustrated, and then I had to, you know, s stop John's and go watch hers, because he kept pausing her and skipping bits of her video. So, watch hers, then his. And decide for yourself. All right. Paul, I feel like we've done a show. Here we are at the end of another diecast. This one's got a symmetrical number, too. Oh, I love it. Coming up on the big 300, which is, you know, an, a number of no special significance. Um, yeah, James and I are going to take our shirts off and carry some round shields and yell. <laughs> <laughs> take our shirt? Wait a minute. You're wearing a shirt? It's cold in here, Seamus. It's gotten down to like 62 now. <laughs> oh, I wish. I wish I could remember what it feels like to be that warm. All right. Thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. If you want to send in questions, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. See you later. So now we just got to get the developers of The Long Dark to make updated graphics version of, of Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus. And then we can tell them that they're not allowed to install their game on our computers.